znate, pa je sve što jedite na kojemu možete da pružite uvažavno profesora koji je danas svoji posjet u ovoj školi. Znači ima mi možemo da budemo samo da zadovoljni jer na taj način povećavamo i kvalitet predavanja i vaše mogućnosti da čujete i one druge koji su od nas u samom sluci bolji. I da vam kažem da je danas naš gost profesor dr. Mihajl Nagel.
why I ask you, are you volunteering or are you here because there's no other speech? <laughs> and if you don't take part, you will not uh, pass the test in business English. So I hope you have a personal gratitude and I hope that you just ask questions. Or, and this is not impolite, if I'm talking about something you already know, you just tell me. And then we just skip it. Okay? Because I have lots of material and we can just focus on the things um, that you want to know. We in Germany, we are very frank, very, very open. Uh, students are very self-assured, so they are used to tell the professors, oh, no, 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 I have understood this, or I have a different opinion, or I know this already. I'm not sure whether it's also the case here, but just feel free. It's not impolite. I, I don't think you are rude if you tell me, okay, we, we know this, go ahead. So time management, um, if you need a break, we can have a break. I don't need a break, so if you want, I can talk until 2 o'clock and then we are And you can enjoy your afternoon, because you were prepared to sit here until 3 anyway, right? And now it's 2. What a great day. Okay, and mobile phone slide was. This is a German slide. You know, I always show my students, because um, 8 or 10 years ago, students were very different. They were just sitting there with a piece of paper and pen. And either they were sleeping or listening, or doing both at the same time, you know, just looking like this, and you know, okay, this guy's sleeping, he's looking at me, uh, yeah, he's sleeping. But nowadays, you have your iPads and your iPhones, and you have all the things underneath your table. That's why I always tell my students, okay, if you need to do that, just leave the room, no problem, I'm not, I'm not angry with you, but uh, it's, it's just important. We did this in school also, some things underneath the table. But that's the difference. Okay, what are your expectations? Any expectations? Very good lecture. Very good lecture. Okay, what is a very good lecture? Fun, then. Fun, then. It should be funny, you want to think, okay? Learn something new and interesting. Okay. So what is most interesting to you when it comes to marketing management? What would you say? What is most important? Uh, the, the, the best way that we can learn something is uh, on examples of... Okay. Uh, the best examples of marketing management, for example. Okay, very good. So I try to give you as much examples as possible. Okay, thank you very much. Any other expectations? Good boss. But I'm just looking at you and you're smiling so nice. I think you have an expectation. You know, my students, they, they love me. On, on the one hand, they love me. On the other hand, they hate me. You know what? I know all that means. <laughs> and it's very easy to just, you know, address them. Someone sitting in the back and, hey, Ivana, what's your opinion? So they sometimes in the evaluation papers they write, I want that Professor Nagel does not know my name. <laughs> it's <laughs> impossible, but I don't know your name. So any any other expectations? So fun, good lecture, interesting stuff, examples. So I tell you what my main approach of business administration is, not only when it comes to marketing, because my, my specialist area is strategic management. This is what I'm doing and what I've done as a consultant for big corporations like ExxonMobil, Daimler, and Bosch, and all these companies. For me, most important are tools. And when I talk about tools, I talk about business administration tools. So you should be like a blue-collar worker. You should be as skilled as a blue-collar worker doing some renovation in your house. He knows exactly which tool he must use to renovate your house. Do you agree? Yes. And you, as bachelors of business administration or masters of business administration, if you are in a business situation, you should know exactly which tool is the best for this situation. So that's my approach, not only talking about past or five forces or SWOT, blah, 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 all these tools that you might have heard already, but to know, okay, when can I apply that? If I have this problem, no matter if it is a big corporation like Dino, or if it is a small or medium-sized company, I don't know, in Niche or in Vario or in some other city. So 
So that's my basic approach. And next time I will come, I will show you my new book. It will be published in June. And maybe some of you will volunteer and you can translate into Serbian language. You can buy it as well. Okay, so let's get started. That's your expectation. So my objective is to just walk you through the marketing management process and make this clear on examples. And I have to rush a little bit because I was forced to do it now in two hours. Usually in Germany, if we focus on principles of marketing management, um, we spend about 40 hours okay, with um, case studies and with questions and discussion rounds, etc. And by the way, if I'm talking too fast, if I'm using strange vocabulary or strange grammar, you just let me know. I want that you understand me. Okay? So, so far, so good. Can, can you follow? Yeah. Yes. Otherwise, I just switch to German. Uh, are, you, are you able to speak German? I don't mind. I don't mind at all. I was picked up by a cab driver um, yesterday evening at the airport, 10.30 or whatever in the evening. And I started to talk to him in English and he said, we can talk in German, I'm able to speak German. I said, wow, okay. And then it was great. We talked 20 minutes in German. Uh, I know a little German because I have a uh, um, Okay, super. But whenever I need translation, then I will ask you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I learned German in six years, but I know just this politics. Super amazing. And who has been in Germany so far? You, you have been? You have been? Okay, so last last autumn? Or in, in, in spring, May, April, May? Okay, you have been to our summer school, so in this cooperation or just on, on your own? Um, okay, and where is your aunt living? Uh, in Düsseldorf. In Düsseldorf? Yeah. Very nice, super. Great! As I told you, I love to be here. Okay, setting the scene for marketing. When I ask you to give me an idea, what the basic steps of a marketing management process are. So you start in my company or in some other company on Monday. And you are asked to develop a marketing concept. And you are asked to go through a marketing management process. And this person is asking you, what are the most important steps in this process? What would you answer? Having an idea. Having an idea, okay. An idea about what? About which you want to market. About? About what which you want to market. Okay. What is your product for marketing? Okay. What else? We need to develop uh, information about that. What are we going to go through? Okay. Analysis. Okay. So we need to prepare. We need to prepare analysis for okay. all that. Okay. And, and what kind of analysis? Uh, Where would you start? Market of, uh, uh, inner market, uh -huh. you know, and, uh, about uh, everything that is around us and inside okay. of the of the enterprise. Okay. That is so external and internal aspects. Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh, oh, super. Do we start with that or do we start earlier? Say that again. We start with. Okay, so first of all, we have to define our key market before we think about small past and da And before that, are we doing something before that? Who is buying shoes in the internet? Hey, ladies, who is buying shoes in the internet? Huh? You're buying shoes in the internet? Never? Always in a shop? Who is buying, I don't know, perfume, books or something in the internet? Yes. Okay. So, if I would be a company like Amazon, and you put lots of things in your basket, okay, books, <coughs> perfume, I, I don't know, you, you can buy everything, you can buy a fridge at Amazon, if you need one, okay? And then you want to, and you want to click on the button, okay, buy now, and get a delivery in three days. When this process takes too long, what is happening? You lose customers. You lose customers. Why? 
because they are expected to, to get products which you have written down that is three days, not five days. No, 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 I'm not talking about the delivery. I'm talking about the process, the process of buying. That's why I took the example of uh, buying shoes. In Germany, there's a, a big corporation called Zalando. And all the female students, they buy their shoes at Zalando. Maybe they have already 20 pairs of shoes and they buy another pair. So why is it important that this process of click the product, put it in the basket, enter all your, um, I don't know, credentials, visa accounts, etc., your name, delivery address, why must that be very fast? The answer is no. It's more basic and that's where the marketing management process starts. Because it's easy. Hmm. What are customers doing if it takes too long? They change their mind. Exactly. Before I talk about a market, I need to understand what? I need to understand how customers function. And if I want to sell something in the internet, I know that there's huge competition. And if I buy something, a pair of shoes which I actually don't need when I... What's your name? Maybe. If I'm Melita and I have already 20 pairs of very nice shoes, if I buy another one, another pair, she starts thinking when this process takes a long time. She thinks, uh, is it really necessary? Do I really need a 21? Do I really need? So, we need to understand how people function. If you go to the supermarket, where's the chocolate position? At the counter, because wow. it's easy. Exactly. If Michael wants to lose weight and the chocolate is in front of the supermarket when I enter, I put the chocolate into my basket and while I'm walking, this chocolate is talking to me. Yeah. Okay, do you really want me 500 kilocalories? <laughs> you are on diet, you really want me, you really want me. And it's expensive. Hey, come on, and there's a very nice lady in the supermarket. Hey, you have to go swimming. <laughs> so the first step of the marketing management process is to understand people. How do people function? Before I think about a product, before I think about, I don't know, um, product policy or price policy or the market and the competition, etc. I need to understand how people function, how people buy and what people are doing when they buy. How they collect information, how they slice and dice the different pieces of information, etc. Just come back, if you want examples, just come back to a supermarket example. Huge supermarkets are organized how? In which direction are you walking? Are you walking in clockwise order or against the clock? Yes, yes, yes. Why? Why? And it's based on research. It's not because someone just said, let's organize the supermarket the other way around. Why? This is the first step of the marketing management process. Because you do not have to think about the time. You walk slow. Yeah. If you walk clockwise, People, no matter in which country, they walk faster. So if you organize a supermarket in clockwise order, you rush through the supermarket. And they have realized, based on research, that people buy less. And they enjoy it there. And they enjoy it if you make, because it has a, it gives you a more relaxed feeling. Of course, if you are in a hurry and if you are very stressed, it might not have an effect. But on average, it has an effect, so they organize a supermarket against the clock order. Usually people when go to supermarkets, they are not in a hurry, because they're in a supermarket. The market is a huge place, but you can look everything, everything is there. So, just one example how to organize that. Lots of other examples out there when it comes to products, when it comes to shoes, to perfume, or whatever. And that's the first step of the marketing management process. It's what we call a theoretical perspective. How do people function? And I don't know if you are told, if you have your economic 
these lectures, you are told that you are Homo economicus. Right? You've heard this? Homo economicus? Have you heard this phrase? Yes. So Homo economicus, it's actually the, I don't know, artificial human being of economics. So all the models are based on this idea of Homo economicus, that we are rational, that we collect information, and that we take the best option. Do you agree that you are rational, that you are homo economicus? Yes. Yes. Alright. I prove you that you are not. If we go to lunch together, okay? I enjoy much more to go with you to, to have lunch than you know. I think it will be much more fun to be together. So we walk the street. You are on my left side, you are on my right side. And we walk, and all of a sudden I see there's a purse. And I pick up this purse and I check it, and inside, 300 euros. Lots of money. And I give you 10, and I give you 10, and I keep the rest. What do you think? Be very open. What do you think? Hey, hotel lobby, you could have said, hey, come on, Mr. Knight. 
Sorry again to this cheap supermarket. <laughs> if you want to buy me a bottle of water, I don't know why you're always talking to me. I know my bikini is very nice, but <laughs> you always need this bottle of water in order to talk to me. So if you want to buy a bottle of water for me, please go to this cheap supermarket. She could have said this, but no, she said five euros. And I'm sure in reality, I would bring her the bottle and she would pay five euros. Very interesting. And this goes back to this fact, theoretical perspective. How do people function? We are not talking about tests, what, da, 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 and all this kind of stuff. So, let's jump a little bit into this. So, what is a market? Of course, if we have understood how people function, how they work, and I would like to I don't have something to write here, but it's not important. If you like to read more about this, there is one very, very famous um, economist. He's teaching and working in the U.S. His name is Dan Ariely. A-R-I-E-L-Y. Maybe you've heard this name. Dan Ariely. He's all of the time doing just tests with students and with consumers in order to prove that the whole economical is not existent. He's simply not existent. Another quick example, because you wanted examples, and I hope you can transfer them to your daily work. Let's assume, let's assume um, I'm working in your company as a consultant, and I split now the group here. Yeah. Okay. Group B, group A. Okay. And I do something with you. What's that? Okay, this will function. I do something with you, and then all of a sudden my very fancy smartphone is ringing, and I pick it up and I say, Hey Jim, yeah, that's great. Oh yeah, 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 pizza would be great. Yes, yes, with onions. Yeah, cheese, perfect. Oh yeah, okay, make it spicy. Yeah, let's meet at uh, 2 o'clock. I, I finish here, yeah, this stupid stuff at 2 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great, thanks. And I continue with you. What you are doing, you are preparing math, um, math tests. And for every correct answer you give, you are paid money. Okay? And I've overpaid you. This is the situation. I've given you too much money, you as a group. You understand the situation? And then there was this phone call. Groovy, same situation. They are preparing math tests. And I pay you for every correct Answer, and I overpay you. I was just not careful, I give you too much money. You know, I throw a ratchet. <laughs> and then also in this group, telephone rings. Hey, Jim, yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, pizza. Oh, pizza would be super. Yeah, onions, cheese. Uh, yeah, finish at 2 o'clock with this stupid stuff. Uh, okay, and then we can have lunch. I'm very sorry. This was very impolite. I'm sorry. This was my friend. I haven't seen him for many, many years, but now we have uh, lunch together, as you could have heard. We have pizza together. I'm sorry that I didn't Which group is giving back the money? Which group is giving back the money that I have overpaid no. for solving masters? B. B. The answer B. is group B. Culture makes no difference. If you do this test in Russia, if you do it in Serbia, if you do it in Italy, if you do it in Brazil. Why? It's because you have to apologize. I've just apologized. Here in this group, you think, what a rude guy. Hey, he has given us too much money, but he's such a rude guy. Let me keep him. Fairness? So this rule of fairness, this motive of fairness is vanished. Because you think it is correct to keep the overpaid money because he's rude. We must not be fair. Here you think, that was very rude. And he smiled, and he looked at us and said, I'm sorry. Like my daughter, you know, she's blonde, 10 years old. Daddy, you know, she, she can do that. Just moving the head a little bit. Come on, Daddy, give me the money. <laughs> I, I think especially girls, they learn very quickly this theoretical perspective, how this functions. I can see it at my daughter. So, very, very basic facts. And this is influencing everything, and maybe more important than some product features. Just think of Apple. My brother is living in the US. If there's a new product, a new Apple product, what are people doing? 
they sleep in front of the shops. Can you imagine? They are sleeping in front of the shop in order to buy something, and then they leave the shop like this. <laughs> they are happy that they were allowed to buy something. They were allowed to spend their money, and they are happy to do that. And they are sleeping fans in front of the shops. What does he have? And it's not about product, it's not about price, it's not about promotion, it's more. Apple has understood how you function, or how we function, and lots of other companies as well. But when we have analyzed that, then we need to understand, okay, what are buyers, what are companies, what are lobbies, what is our market? What would you say is the most important information about the market we should, we should collect at first? I'm not used to so many pictures of me all the time. <laughs> what is the most important? You should take pictures of it. They are much better looking than I am, so I don't. Uh... We understand how our customers, we understand how our business will work, what will be our products, how are we going to place in the market. And I phrase my question differently. I was not precise. I make it again as an example. Let's assume, who has been in the US of you guys? Someone in the US? Never before? Okay. But let's assume I'm coming from um, the health industry. Okay? I'm coming, I was a manager in the health industry. My name is Dr. John. And you are now my consultants. You are smart business administration people. Okay? And I ask you, I want to start new business. And I come back to my question, what do we need to know about the market? I want to start a new business in the US. I want to sell burgers, french fries, and soft drinks. I want to do that in the US. What would you say? Would you say that's possible or would you say, oh, in the US is possible? We have McDonald's, Burger King, this market is. Ooh. I believe we have a good uh, market. say um, my product is different because of that, because of that, maybe people come to try and uh, if their expectation is, uh, is um, yes, mm -hmm. that's why maybe we can uh, uh, by, um, we can um, uh, uh, sell our product. Mm -hmm. okay. Now this Dr. John, he has only a little time. He just wants two or three numbers from you. If it is possible to address this market, yes or no, what would you do? What kind of numbers would you give him? If you talk about our competition and if we have the right marketing, we can do. He wants to know now. What, what numbers? What are the most important numbers about the market? Investments. Investments. Have you ever heard the phrase or the, the term market potential? Yes. What is market potential? Putting new product on the market. Say that again. Putting new product on the market. No. no. It's about beating the competition. It's always about that. Right. Let's make it very precise it's because it's very important. Our profit. How big our profit can be. How big our profit can be. So market potential is the sales out there. So in terms of hamburgers, the hamburgers we could potentially sell. Yeah. This is the market potential. What is the market volume? So this is very important to remember. Market potential is, and I show you a slide, then you have it also in the graphic. Market potential is what you could achieve in the future. Market volume is what we have now. What is already achieved now by all the companies in the market. This is the market volume. And our sales volume, our company sales volume, is the little piece of this market volume. So if this Dr. John is now asking for a number, what kind of number from a mathematical point of view would you give him? Market potential, market volume, or something else? What would you give him? He wants to know, should I enter this market, yes or no? What would you give him? Market potential, market volume, or something? Market potential. I'm a mean guy. Look at the people I have. 
but I'm uh, very nice, very kind. <laughs> Maybe how big is loss can be. And, and this is based. This is based on what? On potential. If you would start a business, if you have market potential and market volume, how, what do these two numbers give you? If you build the ratio. No. Market volume, what is actually in the market sold, divided by market potential, gives you how saturated a market is. The market saturation. saturation. So if market volume is, let's assume, 1,000 units, and the market potential is 1,010, you would say, oh my god, this market is saturated. There is not enough space for someone new unless you take huge efforts and take away lots of things from the competition. But that is very difficult. If competition is strong, if we start now to get a, a new car company and we want to beat BMW and Volkswagen, it will be very difficult. It will be possible. Lots of investment is necessary because this market is very saturated. So this Dr. John would ask for a number and he would say, okay, let's look at market potential, market volume, and then just calculate the market saturation. What was the answer from these consulting guys who consulted this Dr. John? Mm -hmm. Market saturated, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Very saturated. You have Wendy's, Sandy's, McDonald's, Dunkin' Donuts, mm -hmm. the biggest burgers in the world, blah, blah, blah. Everywhere you can buy burgers, french fries, and soft drinks. What, this, what did this Dr. John do? He started a business. Exactly with what you said. He said, I don't care about market saturation. I have a different idea. And he started his first restaurant in Phoenix, Arizona. And he called it, you can Google it later if you want, and there are nice movies on YouTube about Dr. John. It's a real story, a real example. And he called his restaurant chain Heart Attack Grill. And he knew, I must do something different. I must do something different than McDonald's or Burger King or whatever. Okay, let's call it Heart Attack Grill. If you enter this restaurant, there's a big plate. On this plate is written, Dear guest, our food will kill you. <laughs> He's not trying like McDonald's to sell it and orange juice, and a little bit of salad, you know, a burger and one tomato on it, to give you a good feeling, it's healthy, I have one tomato. No, he's throwing it in your face, our food is not healthy. And he calls his menus, triple bypass burger menu, <laughs> quadruple bypass burger menu. If you enter the restaurant, you have to weigh yourself. If you weigh more than 130 kilograms, you get everything for free. <laughs> so you enter, you enter this restaurant, you don't get french fries in little paper boxes, but there is a menu of french fries. So if you want, you can you know, eat one kilogram of french fries if you want. If you eat the quadruple bypass burger menu, you have eaten 8,000 kilocalories. So you shouldn't eat for four days if you have eaten that. But if you are able to eat it, you get another one for food. <laughs> Who is serving in this restaurant? Who is serving in the heart attack grill? Any idea? Yourself. Say, love. Some girls. Nurses. Nurses. <laughs> They are dressed like nurses, and you can imagine they are the best looking girls around in Phoenix. They are dressed like nurses, I'm very sure they will be not able to help you if you have trouble. <laughs> I'm 100% sure. I want to but they are dressed like nurses, and if you have eaten this quadruple bypass burger menu, they accompany you to your car. Okay, this Dr. John, has he become a millionaire, yes or no? Yes. He has understood, okay, this market is saturated, but now because of saturation, I need differentiation. If this market wouldn't be saturated, I must not invest. 
I must not even think about differentiation because if there's so much space for burgers and for french fries, why should I invest in differentiation? Why should I invest in nurses? Why should I invest in a different look and feel of my restaurant? But he knew, okay, saturated market, but still I think the Americans, they are a little bit crazy. You know, they just need big food, and you can imagine 95% of the guests are male, of course. And most of them are fat, yeah, that's right. Um, but it works. So he has now four or five restaurants, he will never become as big as McDonald's, for sure, but that's not his target. He just wanted to do something, he went out of the health business, and he wanted to become a millionaire. Dr. John, and now he is. He's sleeping with a big smile on his face. <laughs> because he's just selling burgers, french fries, and soft drink. Even in a saturated market. Yes, yes. I don't know how long it will work. I don't know if it works in different countries. I don't know if you have Hooters here. Do you have Hooters in Serbia? No. Hooters is uh, also a US American restaurant chain and also um, good looking girls in t shirts they are serving. It doesn't work in Germany. Not at all. They try to implement it, but it's, it's just not attractive for the people. They just do not care. They feel that for them it's too much. Of course, Germans, like I think everybody in the world, likes good looking people, no matter if they are male or female. But for them, if people, if families go to a restaurant, they don't care if this, you know, this waitress is looking like a, a top model, a 19 year old top model. So it does not work at all. It has a a strange image, so people they don't like to go there. If you say to someone, let's go to Hooters, it's like, ooh, red light, red light district? Really? You're sure you want to go there? So it does not work in Germany, but it works perfect. It works perfect in, in, in the US and in some other countries. Okay? Very good. Actually, I don't need slides, but I have professors. So this is market potential, market volume, and just keep that in mind. Sales volume. So let's assume this is our company, A. Eh? Market saturation. So if someone asks you, your company in which you are working, is a new market attractive or not? I would start not with competition or something. I would just start with two numbers. Market potential, market volume. And then you just decide, is this a saturated, not saturated market? And based on that, you continue your analysis. How much do I need to know about competition? If there's a fresh market, not saturated, I don't invest one euro thinking about competition. I do not make benchmarking and all that stuff. I just throw my thing on the market and do my business. But if it's saturated, I have to think about maybe nurses or some triple bypass or that stuff. How do you get market potential and market volume numbers? You become marketing manager now and you will do it in a company on Monday. What's your name? Yes. Ivan. What would you do? How do we get these numbers? Market potential, market volume. Some kind of research. That's always a good answer. <laughs> Some kind of research. What kind of research? How do we get this number? Google. You're afraid, no, but I ask you again. How, about, how, about. how do we get these numbers? We get numbers on the market. Okay, so market volume. How do we get market volume? And are you always using the absolute number or are you sometimes using the relative number? What would you say? Precise use. The absolute number. Precise number. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> How do we get market volume numbers? Again, it's a question of what is the purpose of getting it and how much do we need to invest? Is Ivana doing two weeks research for just one number and she's very, very expensive? I have to pay her how much do I have to pay her every day? If you do market research for me, a lot, okay, so she's very expensive. <laughs> and she wants a company car, right? And an American Express credit card. <laughs> if a market is not differentiated a lot, 
then I would try to shoot for a precise number if I have 8 or maybe 10 or 12 companies on the market. Otherwise, I just take the three biggest. Just the three biggest. And based on that, I calculate my market potential and my market volume. We call that absolute market volume or relative market volume. And usually, in practice, if you would work in a consulting company, very often you just take the three biggest. And this is very simple because the three biggest companies usually have to publish the balances. So it's, sorry, you want to do that already? Lots of money with me. Um, I just tell you, okay, log on to the internet and take the three company reports, and in 15 minutes you have the numbers. Very easy. And then you have your market volume. And potential, yeah, you need to some scenario studies and think about that if it's worthwhile or not. And companies are doing that every day. Think of Porsche, when they want to sell their cars, to, or when they started to sell their cars to China, what did they have to consider in that time, many years ago? How many cars did they going to sell? Okay, and what else? So market potential? Uh, how and when, many what do they have to consider when they thought about market potential? How many people can buy the car? How many people? And this is based on what? Per head income and what else? Very special Culture. situation in China. Culture not. You have that also here because until now we do not unfortunately belong to the EU, but this will change on very sure. What do you have? Customs. If you buy or if you bought a Porsche in China 10 years ago and this Porsche cost 100,000 euros in Germany, how expensive was it in China? As much as 200. They had 100% luxury. So when I calculate the potential, I have to think about not who can afford a Porsche, I have to think about who can afford a Porsche, the delivery from Germany because it's not pretty and the customers, 100% luxury tax. This is what I have to consider as a car company. And then I think about, is it worthwhile to enter this market? Yes or no? Yes. All right, and they entered this market because they are hot, which unbelievable. When we talk about marketing, what is marketing, by the way? Marketing has changed a lot. I, I don't walk you through this whole slide. Maybe you've discussed the history of marketing. But nowadays, marketing is everything in a company. So marketing managers, they think they are the most important people in the company, more important than the CEOs. Why? Because they say, and this is the last step, customer-oriented management, everything in a company must be analyzed from the customer. So do we need IT? Do we need HR? And what kind of HR? What kind of sourcing do we need? What kind of production do we need? Everything is based on the customer. And everything that is not necessary, we just throw out of the company. To lose weight, outsourcing, all these uh, fancy instruments that we have out there. Okay, what is the now we have understood the market, we have, have understood the customers, now we need to develop a strategy. What is a strategy? The lady in the back. What's your name? Me? Yes. Dragan. Dragana? The Dragan. Me. Just Dragan? <laughs> <laughs> With an A at the end. A good friend of mine, I told you, Vladimir, he's from here and he has a little daughter. Her name is Jana. And once we were together, we played football a little bit, and Jana was running around and he, he shouted out, Jano, Jano! And I said, hey, Flavi, you are stupid. Your daughter's name is Jana. And he said, hey, Mike, it's my language, okay? We have something we call vodka tea. <laughs> <laughs> and when I call her, and I call her, it's not Jana, it's Jana. I said, okay, my friend, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I got it. Now it's your turn. What is a strategy? Okay. A plan. What is the vision and what is the vision? <laughs> a vision is what we expect in the future. Okay, and what is a vision? You are very good. Okay, and what is
understand the strategy? It is the way how we accomplish these uh, final goals that we have. If you open textbooks, you can't get confused by these three terms, vision, mission, and strategy. What would you say is the most important and what comes first? Okay. I would say the vision comes first, because where does your targets come from, your company targets? You must have something. You want to be the best airline in the world. You want to be the most profitable pharmaceutical company in the world. That's your vision. And your mission is then your purpose. Why are you here? Why should this um, business exist? Why should Heart Attack World exist? To make people fat or happy or I, I don't know. And then the strategy is like a map. It's your plan to this mountain to achieve your vision. Maybe the best explanation of what a vision is, um, is from Kotler. Have you ever heard this thing? Yes. Philip Kotler? Yes. It's an? He, uh, he's called the father of uh, marketing. And what's his explanation of vision? So if you open textbooks, sometimes there are five pages what a vision is. Forget it. Just remember one sentence. It's an almost impossible dream. <laughs> it's a dream. It's not impossible, but it's almost impossible. Why almost impossible? Because it's not easy to get there. If you think, hey, my vision is to have a... a you are graded like 1, 2, 3 or A, B, C? Uh, one, two, five. Five. So 1 is the best, 5 is the worst. Yeah, five. Ten. Five. 6 to 10. 6 to 10. Okay. Uh, and, uh, 10 is the best. Yeah. Ten yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if your plan of this gentleman here in this black t-shirt, if your plan is in my, ne my next, my vision is in my next test, I want to have a name. I would say, oh my god, that's not a vision, it's very easy to get. A vision is almost impossible to do. Okay, and the mission, just think of Star Trek. You are on a mission, you want to accomplish something, you have a purpose, you want to save the earth or whatever. You know Star Trek? Yes. yes. It was my, my favorite, my favorite <laughs> Okay, in order to develop this, we again need a process. Just forget about the slides. We need to, what you said, we need to analyze the environment, external aspects, and we need to analyze the internal ones. So now I need your help. I have no idea. And I want to know what kind of tools can I apply. We start with you. Internal, I want to understand where we are strong, where we have weaknesses. Which tool do you take out of your box? By the way, what's your name? Alexander. Alexander. My, my brother's name is Alexander. <laughs> Very nice. Alexander, welcome. So, internally to me. What would you take out of your box? Swap analysis. No. I explained to you that lots of people use the SWOT analysis wrong, and I tell you today how you apply it wrong. And you can tell all the people that have told you. Any idea? I want to understand where my company is strong all week. You are now, and this is very interesting, if you would have a house and you would invite people, blue color workers, and they should renovate your house, and you would ask them, okay, look at my bathroom. It needs renovation. Please tell me, how can we do that? What would you do? And if you would say, I don't know, what would you do? You would throw him out of the house and say, hey, come on in here, go away, don't waste my time. You wouldn't say that because of you would like say, thank you very much for your time. And you could close the door and say, yeah, come on in here. <laughs> and you are business administration students, so you, you are expected to know what you, what you take out of your box. So if you work tomorrow for Porsche or BMW, or, which is possible, which is almost impossible to read, but it's possible. You come to Germany, and I hope I can attract you to come to Germany because companies are, are in need of smart people, and here are lots of smart people sitting in front of you. And Germans are very nice. <laughs> Much nicer than I am. So, <laughs> so you're helping her? You're helping Alexandra? Um, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. You can now get a consulting project and they give you one million euros. They just want to understand, okay, 
what are we trying to analyze in order to get to a strategy. But first of all, we need to understand where is my company strong and where is it weak. Please give me an idea. And now, now it's your turn to have a pen in your hand. In your hand. <laughs> in your hand. And a flip chart. And you try to convince this guy who is sitting on the box of 1 million euros. And this happens in practice very often. We won a project with ExxonMobil, big oil and gas company. And the CEO of this branch, who just asked for an approach, he was very dissatisfied with the profitability of a, of a branch. And we were standing there exactly in this situation. He invited us and he said, I need your advice now. Give me a smart idea how to do it. And we had brown papers and we had no slides. He said, don't bother me with PowerPoint consulting slides. I don't want a consulting show. You just get a pen and I want to see your approach. And we started this and we won a $24 million project. So now that's your situation, Alexandra and Denise. Ivan, damn it, Oh, there's so much nice names. I will remember this. And your name? Dunya. Oh, that's it, Dunya? Dunya. Dunya. Can anybody help? We want to win this project. So we are making interviews with salespeople. For example. Okay, with our employees. So employee approach. No problem, no problem. Because uh, they are in touch with our customers. Okay. So one approach in order to understand our strengths and weaknesses would be to ask our people. Maybe this guy says that's not very objective because it's, there's a bias, we call that a company bias. If you work for a company, maybe you think of your company in much better terms than it is actually the case. So we need some objective analysis. What else could we do? I'm very sure if I just mention this. Getting in touch with our customers. Getting in touch with our customers. Yes, very good. What could we do? What are their needs? Very good. Have you ever heard the Khan analysis? Here we go. So that's what I keep saying. You know it, you must apply it. So if you want to understand where are we strong, where are we weak, you could apply as one tool the Khan analysis. Because Khan gives you an idea are we fulfilling all these basic requirements? But do we also have some, what he calls, performance requirements or even the ones that make us very happy? What are we fulfilling? And this is more obje objective than asking our sales for. So, customer focus um, to understand if we are strong or weak in terms of customer satisfaction. Okay, come on. What else? i give you one example. Let's assume we are a pharmaceutical company, and I think it's the same all over the world. If you invent a new drug, and I had problems with my back, I still have a little bit because I was riding on my mountain bike with some good friends, and we were going like crazy through the woods, and you know, when guys uh, are not watched by their wives, then terrible things happen, and this happened, and that's why I had to take some pills in order to, because we crashed a little bit in the woods, but that's it. Um, if you are a pharmaceutical company and you invent drugs, the government gives you what? Approval. And what are the pharmaceutical companies striving for to get a patent? Why? Because then you are for 15 years in peace, right? You have a patent on your drug, you can sell it for whatever price, and no other company is allowed to sell exactly the same drug. Let's assume we are pharmaceutical companies, a company, and we have maybe three or four patents, but we realize that they are running out. How would you analyze that? And you know it, if I say it, everybody goes like, oh yeah. It's a tool to analyze strengths and weaknesses. Mm. Product, lifestyle. Mm. 
It's a tool in order to analyze if you are strong or weak. And I, by an example, I want to show you how. Your pharmaceutical company knows, okay, that's, and I show you later, that's a product life cycle, like a life cycle of a human being. You grow up, you are very, still very young, 20, 21, 19, 22, whatever, something like that. I'm almost here on top, so maybe half of my life too over already. And, and then it degenerates and then products die, people die, markets die, branches die. So you just take the product life cycle of all your products, or if you're in the service industry, of all the services, like a university, and you just think, okay, do we have new products? Do we have something in the pipeline? Yes or no? If we have just five patterns, mature products, we can just sit there and wait until we die. Because if they run out, all the other companies are just waiting to take our pattern, to take the formula, and sell it much cheaper. Because they do not invest in research and development, so they have a much cheaper value chain. So we are done. Okay, cemetery, nice song, and of this company. So you can use that as a tool in order to analyze strengths and weaknesses. So what are pharmaceutical companies doing in this situation? And this would be then a strategy that you get out of the sport, surely. Um, they either use a new product, similar to the others, okay. or change the main product, added something new. For example, they used to have the medicine for the flu, but now they have medicine for moving the vitamin C. So add something new that customers okay. don't like. Okay. Could be an idea. But based on just some uh, product, we would call that product variation. Based on product variation, you do not get a new pattern. And I want a new pattern because then government tells me, hey, man, 15 years you can do whatever you like. And I like to do whatever I like. <laughs> and if I just add some vitamin C or whatever, I do not get a pattern for this drug. What do they do? It's very simple. If you look up the product life cycle, they buy companies that have something in their pipeline. They buy small, if you open the newspaper, it's happening all over the world, that big chemical and pharmaceutical companies are buying very small biotech companies. And you might sit there reading this article wondering, why is this big company buying this 100 people company? The answer is, they have a pipeline. They have a potential new product in their pipeline. And if I look at my product life cycle, here's nothing, here's nothing, here's nothing. Here are three patterns. So I buy something on the market in order to have something in my pipeline that might be in three years a new pattern. Based on product life cycle analysis, I develop this kind of acquisition strategy. Okay. What else could we do? Oh my god, this guy is stubborn. <laughs> Rock and roll. What else could we do internally? So we have now we have looked kind of customer satisfaction, products, product life cycle. What else could we do? And we have talked to our salespeople. Is this CEO now happy, satisfied with our approach? No. Not yet, huh? The gentleman sitting next to you, what would you say? What's your name? Mila. Mila. That's easy to pronounce, huh? <laughs> um, the price is important. Okay, price is important. What else? And then we come closer to what is also important, especially internally. What? Quality and? What about costs? Have you ever heard the term value chain analysis? Value chain analysis, have you ever heard of Michael Porter? Mm -hmm. Yes, this is an internal tool in order to analyze. So here we have our profit, you agree? And why are we doing this? Because we are altruistic, because we are nice people. No, we're not doing that because we want to make profit. We are nice when we come home, right? When we talk to our girlfriends or boyfriends or father, mother, brother, etc., then we are nice. <laughs> But in business, we want to make profit. We are not altruistic. Yes, we are also nice and fair. We stick to the rules. But 
we want to make profit, nothing else. That's why we do it. No, of course it is. And our all, the whole value chain it starts here with sourcing material, right? And then we have the primary and the secondary aspects of our value chain. You know that, Mike Porter? So the primary is sourcing, production, marketing, and service. And the supportive activities are HR, IT, etc. And what are we doing? Because we want to understand how we stronger are we weak, we analyze based on this tool, value chain analysis tool, we analyze where are we strong when it comes to profit and where are we weak. Maybe we have 100 nice ladies in HR, but they do not profit at all to our profit. So, I should get rid of them, all of them. But if they are not adding value, value chain enough, if they are not adding value, then I have to change this. Just think in terms of if it would be your company, it's your private money. You would think of every person, if you would be a company, and if it would be my money that I've invested, I would analyze if everybody of you is adding value to our profit. And if not, I would have to find something else for you so that you can add value or save the money. You agree? Okay, so value chain analysis. So now we have some internal ones. External ones, what are we doing? We have to develop a strategy. Now we know where we are strong, where we are weak, a little bit. What are we doing externally? How do we how do we analyze threats? Which tools which tools give us threats? Opportunities and Benchmarking. threats. Benchmarking. Good one. Okay. What else? The lady here. What's your name? Yoban. 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 Yes. Very nice name. So what are we doing externally? We want to understand a branch or an industry. I'm very sure you know that. I'm looking through these two guys. You have an idea? It's a Michael Porter tool. It starts with five and ends with forces. Ever heard that? Five forces? Mm -hmm. Never heard? Very good. Then that's something new. I'll show you in a second. Okay. You just remember, five forces. It's, it gives us threats and opportunities. Five forces normally. What else could we do externally? Trend analysis or scenario analysis? A good friend of mine is scenario analysis. I give you just an example. A good friend of mine is a philosopher. He has studied philo philosophy. What's your name? Oh, that's it. <laughs> Can I just say see me or something? Smith. Smith? Yeah. Very good, Smith. Okay. So Smith. Where is he working as a philosopher? What? Where is he working? What is your guess? Where is this guy working? I don't know. Here, usually they work in school as teachers, actually. Okay. Or being unemployed. Or being unemployed. <laughs> He's working for Diamond. What? For Diamond. In Berlin. What are they doing at Daimler in Berlin? They have a future lab and they have a heterogeneous group of engineers, of psychologists, of philosophers, of strange people just, you know, thinking about the future. Thinking about the future. What is mobility in 20 years? What is mobility looking like in 30 years? How do people want to drive? They do scenario analysis. And many, many years ago, they already invented, and from an engineering point of view, it was possible, they invented that you don't need a key to start and drive your car. You just use your eye or your thumb. Okay? Why haven't they made it as a series in cars that you just use your thumb or your eye? You still need your key. You must not click. So we call that keyless entry. You might have a car like that, or I don't know, your friends or father, mother, or whatever. 
You have the key just in your pocket, and you approach your car, and it opens, and you sit in your car, you press start, and you start, because your car is realizing you are the owner because you have the key in your pocket, but you must not click or do so. But they invented many, many years ago that it can be much, much smarter, you just look at your car. Or say something. Or say something, or you just use your thumb, you can never lose it. And in terms of cost, in terms of cost, again, value chain, a key to produce, a key is very expensive. Lots of technology inside, and you have to program it. So for the company, it would be very beneficial to get rid of keys, and we just use the thumb of the owner. Why haven't they made it reality? Possible, and in Stuttgart we see cars with no one inside. 
they just test it on, on the real streets. You just see a Mercedes driving around and there's no one sitting inside this car. And it stops at the red light and it continues driving 50, 70, 120. Uh, when it's on the highway, it just drives because this car is smart enough to realize everything that is around. People being on a bicycle, red lights, etc. Do we want that? Mm -hmm. As owners of cars? Mm -hmm. So that this car is driving, we are reading really newspaper, we feel like being in a train or in a bus, huh? we are sitting in our own car. So this is a controversial discussion at the moment, how much technology based on scenario analysis. In order to develop a strategy, and this strategy has a long, long, long period. Before I build such a car, I need how many years? What is the production life cycle, design and production life cycle of a car on average? 10 to 20. 5 to 8. It was 10 to 20, now it's 5 to 8. But I'm talking about 8 years. So I must make a decision right now about this product. Should this product be able to drive alone? Yes or no? And then you sell it in eight years. And if you're wrong, you're sorry, you're sacked in eight years because you have products nobody wants. External analysis. Okay. So, strategy. We talk about this. So, company, business, you know all of that, right? Okay. Blah, blah, blah. blah, blah. Mission, vision, vision, strategy. What is the vision? You have it here. So, call it almost impossible to read. Just remember that. If someone asks you to learn a definition like that for a final exam, you say, no, I don't do it. A vision is an almost impossible dream kind of soul. Okay? And the mission, purpose, like we said. Okay? Like Star Trek. Okay, this is what we have done now in the last 20 or 30 minutes. Internally and externally. And now I come to the so-called SWOT. And whenever people use the phrase SWOT analysis, I, it sends shivers down my spine. You know? Very cold, too. I feel it in my back because this is the analysis which is done most of the time wrong. And I tell you why. The answer is the SWOT analysis is not analysis. What is the SWOT analysis? The SWOT analysis, I don't have a cup here or something. The SWOT analysis is nothing else than a bowl or a cup, and you just fill all the data inside that you have. You do not analyze something with the SWOT analysis. You need to have applied product life cycle, Kano, um, value chain analysis, all this stuff, and you pour all the data in your bowl, external data and internal data, and then you have data, you have strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And then you combine them. Strength with opportunities, strength with threats, so SWST strategies. You know that, right? Okay, very good. So please never say the SWOT analysis is a tool to analyze strength or weaknesses, or opportunities, or threats, because actually it's wrong. Exactly, it's the database, it's nothing else. Yeah. And but you, everybody nodded, you said, yeah, you know how to combine these things in companies, and I'm not making jokes. I was working for a company, it's called Merck, pharmaceutical company, and they used, as a result of the SWOT analysis, a matrix, four boxes, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And the CEO said, okay, based on this, we developed that strategy. And you know, as a consultant, you are always in a good position, because you just ask questions. And I raised my hand and said, Dear Mr. CEO, I have no idea how you do that. How can you develop a strategy just based on strength, weaknesses, threats, and opportunities? I wouldn't be able. I want to participate in your smartness. He was like, first, but then we looked at it, and he asked his marketing director, how, how did we come up with the strategy? And guess what? They always worked just with these matrices. Just four cells, four boxes, but they have never thought about combining them. It's not a story. They have never combined it. They have never thought, okay, if I have this strength, if I'm in terms of finance very good, or in terms of brand, Coca-Cola, it's the most well-known brand in the world. There are only two countries in the world where you don't get Coca-Cola, and these countries are? Alaska. Alaska, of course you get Coca-Cola in Alaska, right? of course. Two countries.
countries in the world where you don't get Coca-Cola? Alexander, one idea? No idea? No way? No, even in Pakistan. I feel, I, feel, I feel in Pakistan and Africa, which is very, very, very interesting. In lots of countries, if you just show the shape of the bottle, so there's no brand on it, you just show the shape, people say They have never had a bottle in their hand. They have never sipped on it. They know it is cocoa. It's fascinating. Just by the shape of the bottle. But in two countries of the world, I've never been there. In the one country I wouldn't be allowed to enter. China. Oh, China, of course. Why? Also an interesting question. Why is Coca-Cola and China tasting differently than here in Serbia and then in Germany? Why? That was the NSA, unfortunately. Yeah. Why? Why? Why is it tasting differently? And then we come back. I know I sometimes ask more questions than you can ask. Why is it tasting differently? You just mentioned China. Because of water. Because of the water, right? Because what is Coca-Cola selling? If you once get to Atlanta, in Atlanta there is the Coca-Cola headquarter, Atlanta in Georgia. And if you go down, they, they do like, it, it would be the golden cradle or whatever. You know, they have their, their original formula and they have found What they are doing, they are just selling the serum, nothing else. And then they have the local companies, they just take the serum and they take their local water. And out of this, they make Coca-Cola. So not from Atlanta, they sell the, the fixed and rapid bottles. They just sell the serum to China or to whatever country and they mix it. So if you drink it, if you just travel around a little bit, you will realize that in every country it tastes different because of the water and not because of the syrup itself. Now what are the two countries? Mm. Yes. I don't know. Kim Jong-un, where is he? The Korea. Now North, North, North Korea. And the other country? They are still in embargo, in the US embargo. Right, say that. Cuba. So in Cuba and in South North Korea, these two countries are the only countries in the world where you don't get Coca-Cola. In every other country you can buy. But why? 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 Because there's so much demand. And why you cannot buy it in these two countries? Because there's a ban on it. It's uh, American imperialism. I'm very sure that Kim Jong-un, it's like in the former eastern part of Germany. They had everything but only the politicians and not the rest of the people. And Kim Jong-un, you can be sure that he's drinking Coca-Cola and, and that he's using all the other mass products, but he did, gets it through different channels. But all the other people, they are not allowed to have uh, Western products. And in Cuba, they are still then in Bonn. So Coca-Cola is not allowed, not allowed to sell to Cuba. That's why they have these old towns. If you make vacation in Cuba, they have cars 50, 60, 70 years old. Why? Because they are poor? No, the answer is no. There are still this U.S. embargo. So the products cannot be sold to this country. That's the reason why. It looks like 1950 or 1958 still in Cuba. All right. Because they are responsible for the profit I can make in an industry. Let's use an example. Which kind of industry should we take? Just 
throw me a name of an industry and we take this industry. Which industry should we take? The beauty industry, or the pharmaceutical, or the food industry, or whatever. What do we prefer? Food. Food. Okay, food industry. What are we producing? We are producing hamburgers. Okay. Sandwiches. Okay, so we are producing hamburgers. <laughs> So, we are here in the middle, we are producing hamburgers. So how profitable this industry of producing hamburgers or sandwiches is, is depending on, for example, the threat of new entrants. Is it very easy to enter this industry, yes or no? Yes. If it would be very easy, we would say, this is a threat. Because it would be very easy for someone to just open a shop, and sell sandwiches, right? So for us, it would be, for our strategy, very important to do what? To increase the market entry barriers, right? So we could try to make as organic food as possible, which is very, very difficult um, to copy. This could be a strategy in order to avoid competition. So we would try to make the market entry barriers very high. So one threat would be, what you see on the left side, potential entrants. Another one would be suppliers. Why is that a threat? Why is a supplier a threat or an opportunity? In which case? And why is it a force? Well, because we are buying supplies, they demand of our when we pay them that they supply something, they choose. They are the ones who make demands. Okay. It, it depends where the force is. If we need ham, for instance, and there's one huge ham producer in the world, monopolist, and we are depending on this monopolist in order to make sandwiches, then the supplier, the supplier will be very strong. Just think of the automobile industry, Bosch, I think you all know Bosch. Yes. It's a supplier, but a very strong one. They have invented the ABS, they have invented most of the technology that you find in cars. So Mercedes or BMW, they are not going to Bosch telling them, hey, the price for this product is maximum this and that. It's the other way around. Bosch is telling them, look guys, we have a new technology, and this technology because they are a very, very strong and innovative supplier. So how much money you can make in an industry also depends on how strong or how weak are your suppliers. Or how easy it is to get rid of suppliers. If we, I just jump from the food uh, example to, again to an automobile example. If we are, for instance, um, Audi, and we get from our suppliers tires, what could we do? And we call that horizontal differentiation. Have you heard that? Vertical, horizontal, and lateral. We tell our supplier, hey dear friends, we produce tires by ourselves. We can beat you in the future. So you better stick to our prices or otherwise we produce it by ourselves. This could be a strategy based on the five forces analysis. Substitutes. A good friend of mine, he has worked for BASF, chemical company. He was a director, very rich guy, big car. He was responsible for the cassette business. Who is using cassettes? Do you know what a cassette is? Yes, yes you still know it? Okay. But you were grown up with CDs, right? And this no, no, no. 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 We grew up with the radios and cassettes. Okay, great. Me as well. I had, you know, radio and then I taped my music that? and I was always angry, you know. But this industry is gone. It was killed. Why? Because there are substitutes. If we are in the food industry, we sell burgers or sandwiches. Every other food is a potential substitute. Doing a kebab is a substitute. A cake is a substitute. So this could be a threat. It also could be an opportunity based on five forces. And of course, customers. How strong are the customers? If we are selling yogurt, if you go to a big supermarket here in Belgrade and you stand in front of the fridge, 
you can choose from how many different children? 50? 80? It's not only 10, it's so many different brands and tastes and so you are deciding which one you take. So we as a company, if we know this is how our branch looks like, then we have some indicators what we must do. Maybe the product itself, we can't keep our job like it is, strawberry or doesn't matter. But we must invest in communication. This is the most important because if the customer is standing in front of the fridge, our job must jump into his face for whatever reason. So we must do something. So this is the five forces analysis. In order to analyze how profitable a branch is, my order to Hey, what's wrong? Huh? I've done something here. <laughs> I've no idea what. Maybe this, maybe this, maybe this. Maybe this. Yeah. I just pressed one button. It's very easy to end the show. Huh? Exactly, press a button and, and boom. And boom. But I don't need slides actually. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, you have done this, right? Competitive analysis would be something else. Where do we want to position ourselves? So this would be part of our strategy. This is Tano. And just again, I want to give you a real example because if you look at these pictures, you say, yeah, okay, it's a good tool and I understand this tool, but how do I apply this in reality? I'm here in, in Belgrade, I don't know how many times, but in the hotel I'm usually here, there's always the same customer question. And the same was happening in another hotel chain in which I was with my team. For many, many years. There is always a customer questionnaire and it looks like the same all over the years. It's never changing. It's asking you, was the, uh, the room clean? How was the service? Very good, poor service. Did you have enough towels? Yes, 50 towels are enough. Did you have enough in your bed pillows? Usually if you go to an expensive hotel, in your room you have, I don't know, 20 pillows. Who needs 20 pillows? I need one. That's enough for me, but the whole bag is crowded with pillows and blah, blah, So they ask if everything is nice. And then afterwards, what are they doing? They just assess this and they have a meeting, all the marketing people, and they say, hey, we are great. Customers are happy because they said service is very good, enough pillows, room was clean. What would you do with this kind of results? The answer, is the answer is nothing, because you have no idea if you have just fulfilled basic requirements. Ladies and gentlemen, for a hotel, it is a basic requirement that it is clean, that the service is good, that I have enough towels, it's and it's not what the customers expect. Already. Exactly, exactly. It's what you expect. So if you are in practice, just think of your customer satisfaction questionnaires, because you must change them over the years. Many, many years ago, a free wireless internet in your room was maybe an attractive requirement. You said, wow, I can read emails and be in the internet. Now, it's a basic requirement. Do you agree? Yeah. So they are moving over time. So what makes you happy once, and you can ask yourself, it's the same in your private life. If someone is just exciting you and you go like, wow, I wouldn't have expected that. If it, exactly the same is happening a second time, you say, I had that before. It's terrible, but we are human beings. If someone is, is, is exciting us one time, you will never feel exactly the same if exactly the same will happen the second time. And if it happens the third time or the fourth or the fifth time, you say, okay. It's ordinary. So, if you want to excite people, you always have to find something new based on Kano. So, that's the story behind Kano. And they are moving all these requirements over time. So, please be aware of that if you are in your companies. 
And if you see all the customer questionnaires and people, you know, standing in front and saying, oh, our customers are satisfied and we do a very good job. We have great quality, good prices, good service. Just raise your arm and ask, how often have you asked the same thing? Oh, for the last eight years, great, guys. Maybe we change something. Okay, this is the value chain analysis. Also, Michael Porter. We've seen that before? Yes, no? You yes. just digest it and keep it in your, in your pocket. Okay, product life cycle. This is what we talked about. Okay, pharmaceutical company. Where do I have my products? Do I have mature products? Do I have new products? Do I have inventions? If I do not have any innovative product, okay, I must do something. Maybe I need to invest and just buy. We call that inorganic growth. I just buy a company. And this is how you assess. Um, for instance, where you have a strategic strength and where you have a strategic weakness, some are nodding, so you know that. Okay, and then you combine it and you come up with your SWOT analysis, and in the end you have something what we call a war room. So this is a real picture. You have a war room uh, in the company based on which you monitor your strategy. Or the main management dashboards. Okay, exactly. And this is, you have, you know that? Balance core card? Yes, no, okay, then go back. So this guy over there, on the top right, Kaplan, with his fellow assistant, uh, Norton, they invented something, what we call the balanced scorecard. So if we, you know that? No? Okay. So if we have developed a strategy, what is then most important? What must we do with that strategy? To implement it. And Many, many years ago, lots of people invested lots of time in analyzing and designing a strategy, but they didn't th thought about implementing a strategy. Companies were just focused on what? On what? The CEOs, they were asking for what? For financial data. They asked, how much profit do we make? What is our sales? What are our costs? So companies were monitored just based on financials. And Kaplan and all they said, okay, if we implement a strategy, it's more than just finance. A strategy is more than just finance, and they came up with something, what they call a balanced scorecard. Why is it called balanced? Because it's not only focused on finance, but on four different dimensions. Customers, processes, and potentials. So we need financial key figures in order to implement a strategy. How much profit do we want? How much costs do we want? Do we want to decrease costs by 20%, for instance? How would we like to increase customer satisfaction, maybe based on Kana? Process perspective, maybe we must get faster, closer to the customer, and potential perspective is dealing with you. What kind of skills do you need? So when I'm asking you, this company I talked about, ExxonMobil, their key financial figure is the ROCE. R-O-C-E. What is the ROCE? Have you ever heard this acronym? R-O-C-E. It's Return on Capital Employment. It's like you, what you want. If you have money, you put it on your bank account and you get interest. Right. You invest your money and you get something from the bank. Unfortunately, not too much, maybe 1.8 or 2.1, or if you are not investing in high risk papers. Okay? Maximum 2% you get on, on your bank account. This is the return on your capital employed. And in a company, you invest capital, you have machines, you have plants, you have cars, you have everything. Okay? So, in many, many industries, returning capital employed is the key figure. If we want to improve this figure now, maybe it's 10% and we must be at 20% in two years. Would you say that to hire Vesna in order to improve our English skills would improve the roasting? Yes. Why? Because of special specialty in English. The answer yes is correct and we try to follow this track of argumentation and that's what is behind 
the balanced scorecard. If you would just focus on Rosie, you have only this financial figure in your mind all the time, and you implement your strategy just based on Rosie 20%, Rosie 20%, and you just check your sales, your costs, but you don't check, for instance, what could contribute to this financial key figure in terms of processes, potentials, or customers. And I'll just give you a real life example. It might be confusing. I just walked you through one step because then you have seen it once and then you realize it. On top, improve Rosie. You see it? The blue one, improve Rosie on top of the slide. Okay. So, what this um, balance scorecard is doing now, implementing a strategy means to tell everybody in a company what he or she should do in order to support this strategy. Because everybody should support this. Otherwise, if this gentleman is working 40 hours a week, but not contributing to his overall goal, he's useless. Right? You would agree. I do something, I'm busy, but I'm not contributing to this overall strategy. Why, do, why must this company pay me for being busy? So that's the idea of the balanced core part. So let's start here. And we call this a strategy map. So we just put the strategy down to everybody, down to the, the assistant, to the secretary, to the whatever person. Okay? Increase English language skills. We are here on the employee, on the potential level. Increase English language skills. If we do that, what is the correlation, so the outcome? We can improve our international skills. We are able to work in an international context. It's much easier to talk to international customers. You would agree? Yeah. Okay. So then we have an effective international organization if we have language skilled people. If we have that, we can increase our market and customer knowledge because it will be much easier for me. It would be super difficult to analyze the Chinese market or the Russian market. Because if I find documents, secondary data, if I find documents which I cannot read and assess, they are useless to me. But if I'm skilled in this language, then I can increase my, my knowledge about this market. I can talk to customers. I can walk them through a camera analysis and get an idea, okay, my Russian customers, what do they expect and what not, or my Serbian customers, okay. Based on that, I'm in a much better position to identify growth and interesting segments based here on a process and customer level. And then you see how this links up to a Rossi. So if we have a key figure and on the top level of a company, the CEOs, they are talking about Rosie and sales and return on sales, etc. But our job in marketing, in different functions is to, we call that cascading down, to cascade this strategy down to every employee and to highlight to every employee, your contribution to our strategy is that you try to improve the English skills of your team, of your sales. So you understand a little bit the idea of um, balance core, a little bit, balance core card, strategy map, Kaplan and Norton, just remember these two names, they were the inventors of this idea. Alright. Okay. Strategy. Now we need the operative or the oper operational part. You know the four P's? Yes. Yes. Product, price, place, promotion. Are there more P's out there? Three more P's. Okay. What kind of more P's are there? And why? Why are there more P's out there? Huh? What's your name? Theodore. Oh, very nice name. Theodore. <laughs> Theo? Your friends call you Theo? No. No? I have a good Romanian friend, and um, his daughter's name is uh, also... Theodore. No, but it, she's a girl. Theodore. <laughs> maybe Theodore. I always call her Theodore. Very nice one. Okay. So why do we have three more P's? And in which industry? Because these business administration guys, they were just feeling bored, and they thought, that P's not enough, so let's cook up some...
Maybe? Who said maybe? <laughs> Me not. Huh? Why? In which industry it is more important to, in the operational part, to think about more than just product, price, promotion, and the sales channels, place. In which industries? I'm in this industry at the moment. Uh, industries that don't have actually big profits, like uh, schools or... Um, yes, it's no, it's not depending on profit. Uh, I didn't mean about the profit. Uh, the... She meant about a profit organization. Mm, not necessarily. Yeah, not necessarily. If you go to your hairdresser, your hairdresser is for your hairdresser. The four P's enough, or does he or she or this, what do we call it, salute shop? Salute? Need more P's? Who, who has a tattoo? No one? Or a piercing or something? If you go to a tattoo shop or a piercing shop, what is necessary? If you are in the service industry, that's the answer. In the service industry, more than four P's are important. Why? Wow. Just imagine, and I was sitting next to a guy on the plane last night who had, I don't know, had heavily to do it here. So I was sitting on the window, and the aisle seat, a very nice young lady came, and I had a nice chat with her, but she had the aisle seat, and I thought, oh, very good situation. If this seat remains free, then we can chat. One hour, 25 minutes, still got better. Very nice. And she was also interested in having a nice discussion because she started, you know, I'm very, I'm very shy guy, so it is. <laughs> so, but then all of a sudden, a big guy, taller than me, and like this, he came with not a t shirt, so a shirt without, I don't know how you call that, but you know what I mean? Yes. Arms like that, tattoos everywhere, and she looked at us, okay, that's my signature. <laughs> Shit, okay. And I had a chat with this nice lady and this guy who was then sitting in the middle. If he wants to have another tattoo, and I'm working in this tattoo studio, and I open the door like this, would it be a good idea? Um, Why? He needs, to, he, needs, he needs to feel comfortable with this. And you say he's not feeling comfortable with me? No, I'm saying that you're not representing it. Very well. yes. Super. He would look at me and thinking, oh my god, this guy, he's tattooing me a tie or something. <laughs> he would be very, very irritated. So in the service industry, another P adding to the 4P is people. People. Because in the service industry, what is a characteristic of the service industry? Well, it's a problem for people. Yeah. It's, uh, it's not visible. It's not <laughs> It's something that yeah, you contact with people all the time. Image we show to our customers. Okay. And very, very simple. Just keep that in mind. The service industry, characteristic of the service industry is that the production of something and the consumption is happening at the same time. At the same time. If the guy producing my joker is smart, not smart, fat, not fat, tall, small, whatever, I don't care. I buy the joker, but I don't see this production guy. But I, if I'm at my hairdresser, or if I want to have another, you know, I have a big dragon on my back, if I go to my tattoo studio, yeah, that's a shirt, it's right or wrong, yeah? Um, if I go to my tattoo studio and I want to have another tattoo, I want to have the feeling, okay, I'm right here. If I go with my 5 million euros to a bank, I don't want that this guy sitting next to me in the plane is opening the door. I want a penguin. I want someone, black tie, white shirt, tie, because that's the kind of bad person I want and I feel comfortable if I give him my door. Right? Okay, if you think of your hairdresser, so people are this important. What else? Now, now we have five P's. Smile. So service industry, huh? Smile. Smart? Smart? Smile. Smile. So people, yeah, it's part of people. Okay? So that's why, that's why in some countries, we talk about Hooters, in some countries there's a positive correlation between um, the physics of people 
and um, your sales results. So if people are very good looking, you sell more. If you know that there's a correlation, okay, you just employ the best looking people. There is. And smiling, yeah. But it's part of people. <laughs> but what else? If I go to the hot hairdresser, what do I expect? Good service. Good service, and especially, what is good service? Translate, translate service into something else? If I have an appointment at 6 o'clock and I come at 5.59, what do I expect? What do I expect? That I'm served when? At 6. I hate waiting. I don't want to be served at 6. I don't want to sit at the address, you know, just looking at these stupid newspapers and reading something about bread. I'm not interested in that. So what is important for this hairdresser in the service industry? Processes! Another P. They need good processes because production and consumption at the same time. If I'm waiting, what is the biggest bank here in Belgrade? What is? The biggest bank? National Bank of Serbia. If I'm waiting with my five million and I want to open a bank account and they let me wait and Alexandra is coming in, hello, just wait, you know, you will be served in a couple of minutes and then after 15 minutes she's coming in again, oh, he's still waiting, oh, wait, hey, come on, I take my five million and go, right? So processes, they need to have good processes. And now we have six, now we need another one, seven. One more. And you just try to remember these examples and then you can remember. Okay, service industry, what is important in the service industry? Are uh -uh, people, processes, because production, consumption at the same time? If you go, if you are employed at KPMG, KPMG is the second biggest um, consulting uh, taxation company in the world, present in, I don't know, 75 different countries. If I hire you, and you come to the, the European headquarter, it's in Frankfurt, what do you expect? If you just walk through the door. A present? Okay. No, 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 present. Presents. Okay. But what do you expect if you just stand in the building and look around? Something amazing. It must be amazing. It must be representative. Correct? So what is in the product P, if you buy perfume, the packaging, the packaging is a very important part of your product policy. If you buy perfume, the cheapest part of your perfume is the water that is smelling. More, more expensive is the what we call flacon, so the bottle and the packaging. And for in a service industry, very important yes. is the packaging, but we call it physical evidence. The building, the rooms. If you go to Harvard University in Boston and you have heard of oh, Harvard, very, very important and very famous university, you'd expect something, right? If you see some rotten place, some old buildings, you would say, that's Harvard. <laughs> You're kidding me. So you expect beautiful buildings, a park, um, a library, huge and with millions of books, right? That's physical evidence. If you are a very, very expensive hairdresser here in Belgrade, you must have a very representative school. Because people compare price and in the service industry. So three additional keys, people, processes, physical facilities. So this is what you know, I guess, right? The marketing mix? Yes. Okay, so product core product, packaging, etc. and brand management also belongs to the, the product P. So this is exact, exactly what we have in the operational marketing mix when it comes to product. Variation, innovation, elimination. What is the difference between variation and differentiation? When do we vary a product and when do we differentiate a product? How many and how different are they from each other? How, Super. They, how special are they? So what is variation, what is different? Uh, different, the second one, is uh, how special the one product is in, uh, next to the other, and the uh, first one is how many are the similar products, I think. Variations of the same product, the same brand, 
kind of, uh, of the same line with the product. You have, I think that uh, we looked at the table, uh, we had lines of products uh -huh. and we have how many variations of these products are. Okay, okay. Some, some sort of that, and that is the difference, okay. actually. What are, what are you using, what kind of brand are you using if you take a shower in the morning? What are you using? What is the brand that you are using? Ox or what are you using? Nivea for men or what are you using? Duff? You know what he's using. No, not how many, what are you using? No. The brand? The brand is straight. Trade? Trade. 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 That's the name? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So you have the hands of the arms. Okay. So product variation is to have that with lemon taste, very fresh, or whatever. This is variation. Differentiation is if you have from the same brand, not only shower, shower gin, but also shampoo for your hair. Deal. Um, aftershave or I don't know what whatever you could use. Okay, that's what I'm So variation differentiation. Variation is usually, and that's important when it comes to marketing, variation is usually not increasing your value chain costs. Differentiation, yes, because you have new products. If I vary a certain car model, the golf, if I just vary it in black and in blue, and I call this one Safari and the other one, I don't know, team, and with different tires, very cheap. But if I have it as a cabrio, or as an SUV, or as a different product, I add a new product to my value chain, which adds cost. So keep that in mind. Variation usually cheap. Differentiation, you have, you increase the number of your products. Okay, super, you know that. Now the key question is, if it comes to product policy, especially when it comes to international marketing, can we standardize or differentiate? One Harvard professor, his name is written there, Theodore Levitt. Theodore Levitt. He said, hey, come on, guys. The world will become a homogeneous global village. He said, we will become all the same. Your taste will be the same as my taste. You will wear maybe the same things than I will wear. Our music taste, food taste, etc. We will become one world. So hey, companies, don't differentiate. It's just expensive and it's useless. Just make standardized products. Make your value chain cheap. He said that in 1982. So if you read the Harvard Business Review there, his famous article was published. Where he uh, followed this idea, and he was the one who invented this term of globalization. In 1982, he first used it. Theodore History has proved him wrong. Mattel, one company, they thought about, okay, Mr. Libby, so you think that we can just standardize our Barbie, just this blonde one, all over the world? And Mattel said, no. We have analyzed our market. We need a fuller one for some markets. We need a different one in Africa. We need a different one in Japan. Now you have, I don't know, 50, 60, 150 different body dolls. Because companies have realized they need differentiation. And culture. Right. Culture, very, very important. Even if it comes back to just names. If you just come back to names, I'll give you some examples. This one, very, very famous cookies in Germany. They are called Kipfel. Just pronounce Kipfel. Just say Kipfel. You cannot pronounce it. And if you go to the French, they are on our border. And you know French and Germans, ah, they are not very, very close friends. And the French want to have everything in French. So in French, they just change the name. But that's product policy. In France, if you buy the same product, it's called Croissant de Lille. Because French people cannot pronounce Kipfel, and they don't want to pronounce it because it's German. <laughs> okay? This car, MR2, Toyota, what is MR2 phonetically in French? 
Put a speed French. Merde. If you speak it a little bit faster, it's called merde. It means bullshit. You can, you can call your car bullshit if you want. But they changed it. And it's product adaptation, and it is very different to what Theodore Levitt suggested. They differentiate not only the product, but also the, just the name, because they've realized, okay, we cannot call our car in uh, France M uh, MR2, and in France it's just MR. There's another car built by Nissan, it's called Pinto. You know what Pinto is in, Sp in Spanish? Who does speak Spanish? Okay, in English it's just, oh, you know, the camera is D-I-C-K. Okay, everybody knows what that is. You can call your car D-I-C-K if you want, because that's the translation of Pinto. Or you just change it. And another example, Traga Noir, it was the best selling male perfume in the 90s. Traga Noir. The, the picture upper left is the promotion campaign in Western Europe. So you see a man's forehand and a woman catching this, this guy, and the other one is from Saudi Arabia. The arm is not naked. You see that? Yeah. So that this guy is wearing a shirt and a jacket. And you see that the woman is not, as you could inter interpret it, aggressively taking the arm of this guy. Okay, now you are mine. No, just slightly touching it and not with the hand. It's even true. Your mind is open. This is this is accepted, culturally accepted. So they had to change it. If we are watching, I don't know commercials here in Serbia, but in Germany, if we are watching commercials, for instance, for shower uh, gel or for shampoo, nobody gets nervous if there are naked people under shower. Nobody gets nervous. If you see that on television or in a movie theater. We see a beautiful lady underneath the waterfall, just using this shower gel. Okay, lady, maybe. You are naked if you take a shower, huh? <laughs> and in the other commercial, it's a, a beautiful man. Nobody mm -hmm. is nervous. In lots of countries, no man. Impossible. Okay, so all the four P's might be changed due to intercultural things. What is the most important, and this is how you can analyze, again, another tool, how you can analyze what you should adapt and change and what not. You have a one axis product adaptation needed, and the other one we call that environmental sensitivity. What would you say is not environmental sensitive, and what can you standardize? Any ideas, any product you can think of? Because there are products out there that you can standardize. You can say, hey, Mr. Levin, thank you very much, you're right, I standardize. I make it very cheap, very for example, cheap. For example, beef. Beef? Beef. Food, you would say? Yes. Okay, we just collect that. Another example. No? Another example. You have it in your computer. Intel? A processor? I would say, hey, come on, why product adaptation necessary? No, standardize this bloody product. Don't even think about to make it different. Why should we? If a laptop is used in Serbia or in England or in the US, in Brazil or China, it doesn't matter. Your Intel processor, you can standardize it. But if you think of the laptop itself, we might have to think about product adaptation. So the software, different characters, in China for instance, in Japan. So different keyboards, Western keyboards or Russian keyboards or whatever. I have a Russian colleague, Maria Vola. She's from Moscow. She has her characters just printed on the Western keyboard so that she can quickly switch. So this would be product adaptation. And I'm sorry, food is the one that you always adapt. Always. Because the environmental sensitivity is the highest, but also pharmaceutical products. If you go to India, you have a McDonald's restaurant here, right? Everybody has been in a McDonald's restaurant so far? Yes, no. no, never before. Okay. I never Good. 
If you go to India, you don't have a Big Mac. That's why I said Big It's the Maharaja Mac in <laughs> India. Because they don't eat beef, they don't eat pork. 70% of the Indians are vegetarians. So you find lots of vegetarian food in a McDonald's restaurant because they have adapted their products, their product portfolio, based on the needs of these people. Have you ever been to Portugal? If you go to Portugal, you get what? In, uh, if you, have been, you get soup in a McDonald's restaurant. Why? Because Spanish and Portuguese people, they like cold soups. Gaspacho, maybe good. They like these cold tomatoes. You get that in a McDonald's restaurant. If it comes to pharmaceuticals, if, Alexandra, if I tell you, hey, I have a headache, <coughs> do you have me an aspirin? You have one? Okay, give me one, please. I don't know. You said yes, so I expect that you have <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. If she would give me an aspirin, how would it look like? It would look white, like this, right? And how many aspirins would I take? If, if I would ask you, how, how many should I take? Just one per day? Two. Maximum two per day? If I have a terrible headache? Four or five. Okay, why are we taking one or two? <laughs> because of our safety, you know, the old, because of what we Okay. If you go to the US, and you are not Alexandra, maybe you are from the US. You are Jennifer. Okay, I say, hey Jennifer, I have a headache. Do you have an aspirin for me? What would she do? She would take out of her pocket a box like this where you can buy chewing gum. You know these chewing gum boxes? And she would just ask for my head, I would do like this, and she would. And I would have maybe 20 on my hand. And I would take them. Much smaller, much smaller, but a lot. Because the consumption habits are different. That's why um, Bayern, in, uh, located in Leverkusen, who has been in Düsseldorf? You've been in Düsseldorf, so if you drive maybe 40 minutes, there's Leverkusen, there's Langsess, and also Bayer. It's a pharmaceutical and chemical company. And they have the, or had a patent on aspirin. They are the only company allowed to call it aspirin. They, based on research, you know that in Germany, if people feel other European countries, if I guess, and you've proved it, in Serbia it would be the same. If 